Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to this week's edition of Extracellular Vesicle Club. EV Club was developed by Ken, but has now grown into an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, that is ISEF. My name is Mitka Lenassi, and I will be your host for today. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Hannah Zierdan Schillinger, a postdoctoral researcher at the Bay Lab at University of Maryland School of Medicine. And I've just learned that she's going to start a new lab, her own lab in, um, soon in August. So um, this is great news. And then uh, her work is focused on understanding mechanisms leading to preterm birth. And today she will present the role of vivis as potentiators of maternal stress during pregnancy. And I'm looking forward to learn more. Just a few thoughts. I encourage everyone to place any comments or questions in the chat box during the talk. And it will be possible to unmute yourself at the end and ask some of those questions in person. And now over to you, Hannah, and you can start sharing your screen. Great. Um, thanks for having me today. I'm excited to share some of my work. Um, in the Bale Lab, we study how paternal and maternal stress affect offspring. Um, and my project is looking at how extracellular vesicles in the context of maternal stress may uh, deliver some of those signals to both uh, baby and to mom, affecting the health of both um, throughout pregnancy and then throughout the lifespan. Just wanted to give kind of an overview of how EVs are thought about um, in the context of pregnancy. And so during pregnancy, uh, the placenta produces a ton of EVs. And in fact, across all mammalian species, EV concentrations are at their highest levels during pregnancy. Um, and of course, the placenta is producing EVs and other tissues are growing and changing um, in response to pregnancy. And so um, other tissues may be producing more EVs as well, but we see it's, um, dramatically increased levels of extracellular vesicles uh, during pregnancy. And these these vesicles play a role in immune activation, um, regulation, proliferation, um, inhibiting endothelial cell function, um, playing a role in modulating inflammation. Um, we know that EVs play a role in implantation, um, as well as things like glucose metabolism um, and uh, glucose uptake in skeletal muscles. And so there's been a lot of great work uh, from other labs looking at some of uh, the roles of EVs in these biological functions that are important for healthy pregnancies, both healthy moms and healthy babies. Um, and in the Bale Lab, as I mentioned, we study parental stress. And so we wanted to ask uh, how EVs contribute to both maternal and fetal outcomes associated with that stress during pregnancy. And so I wanted to give kind of an overview of what we know about stress during pregnancy. Um, and so uh, lots of different things affect how baby develops. Uh, stress uh, is a big one. And uh, this has been shown across both clinical and preclinical studies where um, moms who experience stress either before, um, before pregnancy or during pregnancy have altered um, or we see altered offspring outcomes. And so whether it's how their, their toddlers function, um, birth weight, and stress can take a variety of, uh, or can look like a variety of different things. It can be um, ethnic discrimination, things like uh, famine, um, or traumatic events such as the events of September 11th. And so um, obviously, these are all human studies. Um, in the Bale Lab, we use mice. And so in our mouse model, um, we've demonstrated that mice during pregnancy who undergo stress during the first seven days, which can um, somewhat be corresponding to the first trimester um, in humans. So mice that undergo stress during the first seven days of pregnancy, uh, their offspring have changes in uh, behavioral stress, changes in um, their HPA axis response, stress regulatory genes, they show cognitive deficits and reduced weight gain. And the interesting thing here is that uh, these changes are observed only in male but not female offspring. And so here's uh, a list of papers that have kind of gone through the mechanisms of these, of these changes. Um, I want to highlight um, 
this paper, uh, some of these papers um, in PNAS, uh, where we're talking about biomarkers of stress in the placenta. Um, and so we know that the placenta, we've already mentioned that the placenta produces a large number of EVs uh, during pregnancy. Um, but the placenta really mediates the interactions between mom and fetus uh, throughout gestation. And so baby is getting oxygen and nutrients, growth factors, um, and spitting out fetal waste. And so this really helps play a role in the crosstalk. And we're interested in how um, EVs may also be a part of that crosstalk. So uh, I mentioned that we have identified a biomarker of stress in the placenta. Um, so we looked at um, a variety of genes, both in female and male offspring, control or animals who um, were stressed during pregnancy. Um, and we observed that O-glycosyl transferase or OGT is a biomarker of stress. And so you can see here that the males um, and females both who um, were in a stressed environment during pregnancy, their placentas had decreased levels of OGT. Uh, so what is OGT? Uh, OGT is an enzyme that adds a um, sugar group to proteins. Um, it's X-linked. And so you can see here um, that the females have higher levels than their male counterparts. Um, it escapes X inactivation. So females have about uh, twice as much OGT in their placenta as, as males. Um, it's also a nutrient sensor, plays a role in embryogenesis, metabolism, immunity, all sorts of things that are important for healthy pregnancies and development. And so here we're showing um, that placental OGT is reduced by stress. So again, um, we see that in females, we see a reduction from control to stress. And similarly in males, a reduction from control to stress. And looking at the controls, you can see that um, males have uh, reduced OGT levels compared to their female counterparts. Um, and so we can also look at, um, this is mRNA, um, we can look at protein and then function of protein. And so not only is there reduced levels of OGT um, in the placenta between females and males, but it's also uh, oglycanacylation is further reduced. And so this led us to ask the question, is there a threshold of vulnerability where um, males who undergo stress because they have reduced OGT, does that put them um, in a more vulnerable space for development? Um, and so we can look at um, sex differences in the placenta. And so here I'm showing um, uh, placentas collected at E12.5. Um, the red dots show um, dots that are genes that are significantly different between um, wild type male and wild type female. And so here we're using our um, transgenic model where we can knock out OGT in the placenta. And you can see that there are lots of sex differences between males and females as um, many, many labs have shown. Um, but now when we knock out OGT um, in the female placenta, um, a lot of those sex differences disappear. And so this indicates that OGT, when you, when you reduce those levels to um, similar to a male um, placenta, uh, OGT plays a role in contributing to a lot of those sex differences, which is pretty astounding that one enzyme can play uh, or can contribute so much to these uh, vast sex differences that we see in the placenta. We're knocking out OGT in the placenta. Um, so how does this affect the fetal brain development? Um, so here I'm showing you sex differences in the hypothalamus. Um, this is female wild type and male wild type. Again, um, big sex differences, not a surprise. Uh, but now when we knock out OGT, again, only in the placenta, um, lowering it to, this, to similar levels as the male, um, the female hypothalamus now looks um, much more similar to the, to the male hypothalamus. So OGT in the placenta not only plays a role in uh, placental sex differences, but also uh, in brain development and um, the sex differences associated there. So um, just to kind of show you the uh, sort of uh, readout of this gene, um, here's a male wild type when we knock out OGT in, in his placenta, um, we see a decreased 
um, weight gain that's shown um, after puberty. And similarly, in the females, since there are two copies, we can show this nice dose response where um, a heterozygous knockdown, uh, we decrease slightly, and then um, a full knockdown or full knockout, uh, we see uh, very reduced weight gain. And so, um, again, this happens after puberty. So, um, or this happens after or at the beginning of adolescence. So, um, sort of. Uh, related to hormones potentially. Um, but one interesting thing that we observed is that stress uh, specifically impacts the oglic inoculation of anexin. Uh, and we know that anexin is involved in EV production, um, that post-translational modifications to anexin can affect uh, membrane localization. Um, we know that phosphorylation, which uh, competes with oglic inoculation, influences the stability, localization, and function of anexin. And uh, again, as I mentioned, um, oblique inoculation and phosphorylation compete for serine and threonine sites um, on these different proteins. And so if oblique inoculation um, is reduced in anexin specifically, um, how does this affect the production of extracellular vesicles? And so, um, Again, just to give an overview of anexin and um, why we're specifically interested in it is that um, it's regulated by glucocorticoids and um, glucocorticoids being uh, the st stress hormones. Um, if we're stressing these animals and reducing OGT and then uh, we're reducing the OGT specific or the oblique inoculation of anexin specifically, um, then potentially these extracellular vesicles could be playing a role in communicating signals between mom and baby that um, play a role in the outcomes associated with stress. And so uh, we were interested in how EVs during normal pregnancy as well as stress communicate between mom and baby, um, especially EVs produced by the placenta. Um, and so for these studies, uh, we do cardiac puncture on, um, on animals um, on days, embryonic days 12.5, 15.5, and 18.5. Um, we use EDTA to separate uh, plasma from the whole blood collections, and then use an ion, uh, the, the ISON robot um, size exclusion system to isolate our vesicles. For our characterization, we have um, a zeta view. And so we're measuring the particle size and surface charge of these particles. As we know, the particle size can help us to identify subpopulations of extracellular vesicles, so exosomes or uh, microvesicles. This gives us information on um, their biogenesis and may affect their endocytosis. Their surface charge um, also indicates their stability in vivo. Um, can affect particle-particle interactions, uh, may reflect surface modifications, um, and influence their uptake um, into different uh, tissues throughout the body. Okay, so uh, the first thing that we did was look at how the concentration of vesicles changes throughout the course of pregnancy. And so in this histogram here, we have the size of the particles on the x-axis and the concentration on the y-axis. In black, we're showing non-pregnant animals. In orange, we're showing embryonic day 12.5. In green, 15.5. And in red, 18.5. These graphs here show the size of our particles. So the, the particles that we've isolated are relatively small, um, and their surface charge um, is remaining rel relatively um, consistent across the different groups. So as we mentioned, um, from the non-pregnant state to the pregnant state, um, we see a, a big increase in EV production. Um, interestingly, the E15 EVs um, are lower than either 12 or 18.5. Um, and so I should mention that um, mouse pregnancy is about 19 days long. And so these 18.5 dams um, may have EVs that are being produced to get ready for, um, get ready for labor and delivery. And in fact, I think there was a paper within the last several months showing that um, late-term EVs could uh, initiate labor 
in um, in earlier term uh, dams. And so these EVs um, could sort of be contributing to those mechanisms. Um, we also um, then wanted to look at the stress, the stress group. And so again, our animals undergo stress for the first seven days of pregnancy. We're collecting at 12, 15, and 18. Um, here our colors are the same where orange is 12.5, green is 15.5, and blue is 18.5. You can see that um, the comparing to the non-stress, the control group, the concentration of EVs in these stress dams is uh, much lower. And so compared to their um, same day counterparts, uh, these, these vesicles are significantly decreased across all days of pregnancy. Um, their size is uh, significantly increased. And so uh, potentially trending away from a more exosome dominated environment. Um, and the surface charge remains constant. Um, but the thing that we're really interested in here is how, how vastly the concentration differs between these groups. And so is the number of EVs in circulation, um, is that important for communicating signals between mom and baby? And if, if there aren't enough vesicles, are we, are we losing out on some important signals for, for development? Um, and so we've mentioned a couple times now that uh, we think that the placenta produces a lot of vesicles throughout pregnancy. Um, and so here we wanted to look at how um, the concentration of particles uh, of EVs um, in, in circulation is related to the number of placenta in a litter. And so you can see here both in the control, the solid dots and the uh, stress, the open dots, um, we see an increase in concentration with the number of placenta. And in the stress group, that's um, a significant trend, which um, maybe, as, as we mentioned, um, maybe mom's other tissues are compensating. And um, so we really see that effect um, more significantly in the stress group, um, where in the control group, other tissues may be uh, suppressed because of the stress. Um, so it's sort of masking the influence of placenta on the concentration of EVs. Okay, so um, we mentioned that we got interested in EVs in the first place because we had identified that oblique inoculation of a affects, um, affect, or is affected by stress. And so this led us into asking questions about about EVs and stress, um, but we wanted to look at how in our, um, in our transgenic animal model, how these circulating EVs would be affected by uh, the genotype of the litter. And so we were designing this question, trying to ask how um, a wild type group um, versus a knockout group would look. Uh, so, here we have dad. And so in our wild type group, we have wild type dad. In our knockout group, um, a knockout um, OGT dad. And in order, because we're collecting uh, circulating plasma from mom, we wanted to keep mom's uh, genetic background the same. And so um, this wild type group should hypothetically give us 75% um, wild type. Uh, whereas the knockout group will give us about 43.75% wild type. Um, but as anyone who's ever worked with uh, transgenic animals knows, um, these Mendelian genetics don't always work out the way we hope they do. Um, so we developed this uterine OGT scoring system. And in this system, uh, we give one point to a wild type female. She has uh, two copies of OGT. Um, we give half a point to a wild type male who has um, one copy of OGT. In a knockdown female, so she would be the same as a male, um, we also assign half a point. And then for uh, both the knockout male and female, we assign zero points. And so um, looking at the concentration of particles relative to the OGT score, um, we see the same thing that we've seen in the stress group where um, the concentration of particles significantly increases as 
as the OGT score increases. So the more OGT in the plus in the uterus, um, the the higher concentration of EBs. And this this trend holds true across the three different collection days. Um, and so remember, knocking out OGT is equivalent to or is representative of um, early or early pregnancy stress. During early pregnancy stress, uh, we see lower levels of EVs. And so we've shown the same thing here in our transgenic model where knocking out OGT lowers the concentration of particles that we see. Um, interestingly, we don't see a trend um, with OGT score and either size or surface charge. And so once again, this is indicating to us that maybe during pregnancy, there is sort of this threshold of vulnerability that a concentration really matters. Um, we've also looked at the concentration or the content of these EVs. And so this is going back to our EPS groups. Um, we see that um, stress alters extracellular vesicle protein cargo. And so animals who underwent stress, their EVs have fewer proteins related to um, immune function and more proteins related to metabolic processes. Um, we wanted to ask next um, where these EVs are going and um, are they getting into the fetal compartment? And so here we've uh, isolated EVs, labeled them with a lipophilic dye and injected them back into uh, time pregnancy matched um, recipient dams. Um, 24 hours later, we looked at, we used an IVIS to look at the distribution of these EVs. And we see that these EVs are making it to the placenta, but not into the fetal compartment. And so um, we see the placentas here um, and the fetus here, and there aren't, there aren't uh, significantly detectable levels of um, EVs in the fetal compartment. Um, and this holds true for uh, control to control, stress to stress, and the swap as well. And so uh, we know from uh, work, uh, Yoel Sadovsky, um, who has done a lot of work on how EVs um, kind of cross talk to the placenta. There are tons of different cell types in the placenta. So how these EVs may be communicating with the placenta. Um, we also know that um, these EVs may be uh, communicating then um, to the placenta to communicate to mom. And so um, interested in how this affects fetal development, um, we performed an EV swap uh, once again, um, looking at taking EVs from either control or stress animals and injecting them into either stress or control moms. And then asking, um, do these EVs, which we know reach the placenta, do they alter the placental transcriptome? And so when we take control EVs um, and, or sorry, I'm sorry, when we take stress EVs and give them to control moms, uh, we see zero differences in uh, the go terms of the female placentas. We also uh, see no differences in the go terms of male placentas. Um, when we take control EVs and give them to stress moms, um, we see no changes in the female placentas, uh, but we do see uh, significant changes in um, the go terms uh, associated with uh, protein targeting, mRNA catabolic processes, and immune response. And so thinking about this all together, uh, we know that males are uh, at a higher risk for stress-associated um, developmental changes. And we know that um, moms who undergo stress have fewer circulating EVs. And so there's a potential here for a signal to be missing. And so when we give those EVs back into a stress mom, when we give those EVs back into a stress mom, um, we see that uh, we're able to change uh, the male placenta. And so some of our um, studies um, moving forward have been looking at how um, these might affect development um, and how these offspring um, maybe changed as a result of these uh, EV changes. Um, but again, a decrease as associated with stress 
a change in the EV content. Um, and then the swap that does alter um, the male stressed placenta. And so um, we showed you that uh, early stress during pregnancy affects male neurodevelopmental programming, that placental OGT is a biomarker of stress, and that we can recapitulate those stress phenotypes um, using a transgenic model, um, that both stress and placental OGT deletion decreases circulating EVs, um, that EVs target the placental barrier, um, and that EVs alter genes related to immune function in the male stress placenta. And so I think there really is a potential um, moving forward. We're excited about um, some of this data that EVs may potentiate maternal stress, um, especially its effects on the placenta, which we know affects fetal development. Um, but uh, an important question that we've been thinking about more is, uh, what about mom? And so a lot of maternal fetal health uh, has really focuses on uh, fetal health. And even a lot of work, most of the work I showed you today um, is, is focused on fetal health. But mom plays a big role in pregnancy and um, the mom's health affects fetal health. And so one of the things that we're asking is because OGT is a nutrient sensor, how does how do these circulating EVs play a role in the energy balance that's required for pregnancy? How does it um, promote glucose metabolism or limit glucose metabolism? Um, and does that affect then um, the nutrients and energy source that a uh, baby is seeing? And so um, moving forward, we're going to be looking more sort of at this maternal question um, and seeing how these placental EVs that are not only communicating with the placenta, but maybe communicating with mom's tissues as well, how they affect um, her health throughout gestation. Uh, and so I'd like to thank um, my advisor, Tracy Bale. Um, we're at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, um, our whole lab. Um, as well as our funding sources. Um, and as was mentioned at the beginning, I'm starting my own lab um, at, in the chemical engineering department at uh, College Park um, in the fall. And so we're gonna be asking questions not only about um, mammalian EVs during pregnancy and how they play a role in both maternal and fetal health, but also asking questions about um, bacteria derived vesicles and how we might be able to use those as therapeutics for um, maternal and fetal health. And so um, happy to take any questions and uh, thanks. So Hannah, this was a very interesting presentation, great work and congratulations again for, um, for your um, new position. Um, there's, yes, so yeah, this is perfect. And um, there's already some questions in the chat box and I, will, I already um, allowed everyone to unmute themselves. So I will just call up um, people and they can um, attend this and they can just ask their own questions. So um, Vidya Nand, um, can you just unmute yourself? Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, I should have actually given my shorter name. So you can call me Anand. Hannah, okay, that was a, perfect. <laughs> Hannah, that was a brilliant talk. I'm like, to be honest, I have like so many questions, but I just concise, <laughs> I just concise everything to EV specific stuff. But yeah, the first question, like how different is a cargo between uh, the e cargo of EV between the both the conditions you have given, the knockout one and the healthy ones? Yeah, so we've only looked at um, cargo in context of stress versus control. We didn't uh, look at cargo um, across the spectrum of OGT levels in the placenta. Um, and so I can reshare. Um, there weren't, there honestly weren't a ton of differences um, in, there weren't a ton of differences um, in the, um, protein cargo signatures um, between stress and um, control. And so red means that it's uh, down in stress and green means that it's up in stress. And so um, proteins that kind of shifted away from immune function towards more metabolic function. Um, and so that, it kind of was our, and we did, um, uh, we 
we just did proteomics on these. Um, and sort of this lack of differences, like we know that uh, there are huge differences between control and, and stress animals. And so um, kind of this lack of difference in cargo really um, has had us focusing on the concentration. And so is, is, is it just a numbers game um, in terms of who's talking to who and um, what signals are able to be delivered? Because if you don't have if you don't have enough, then um, you may not be able to um, deliver the appropriate signals for fetal development or, you know, the balance of um, the balance of energy throughout between mom and baby and kind of this glucose processing idea. I was more interested to know whether have you ever thought of doing a metabol metabolite screen on these conditions? Because as you see, as I said, like the, the, the normal animals are big in size and the smaller ones the, and the knockout one, the stressed ones are smaller in size, but they're not lethal. So do you yeah. think there's going to be a huge uh, like a metabolite difference and by hindering the EV biogenesis, there's no yeah. enough metabolite nutrients transfer to the have you thought of working on that? Yeah, example? yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's not something that we've done, but um, definitely something to look into how they're metabolically um, different. Yeah, my last question is like, what kind of stress were <laughs> you given to? Yeah, I think I uh, sort of breezed through okay. that. Um, so our stress model um, is a multimodal stress model. And so um, every day for two hours, uh, our dams undergo uh, two stressors. So it's a combination of tactile, auditory, and olfactory. And so they, they either get put into wet bedding, into a restraint tube, or into a cage with no bedding. Um, our auditory stressors are owl screech or white noise, and our olfactory stressors are um, fox, fox odor or puma odor. And so it's a combination of two of those. Um, okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. That's Thanks for the question. Um, so, so just a follow-up question. So did you try to use different combinations of stresses and to see if this affects the release TVs or the... Yeah, so uh, this, this work was some of the really early bail lab work where they looked at um, different types of stressors, different... Um, combinations, different amounts of time, stress during different stages of pregnancy. Um, and so that's, uh, yeah, 15 years ago or so, they kind oh, of okay. identified um, that the this biggest. early time window was really the window of vulnerability. Um, and uh, yeah, we have some work. Um, it's so the bail lab is uh, very neuroscience heavy. And so people uh, doing um, asking specific questions about how different neurons are affected by uh, different stressors and um, yeah, more, more of like how the stress actually affects the brain. Um, nice. So, yeah. And we have another question from Saraf, if he's still here. Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. It was a great presentation. Uh, regarding for uh, <coughs> pregnancy a model of stress, uh, I have some clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, basically, the stress um, also causes increase the blood pressure. Am I right? Um, so did, did you measure any uh, blood pressure in your animal model? We haven't measured blood pressure here. No. Okay. Uh, then, but yeah, you're you're right that. Um, yeah, differences in blood pressure could be, you know, differences in shearing and then lead to differences. Yeah, especially in the pregnancy model. Pregnancy yeah. causes various things. Uh, it's 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 uh, involved uh, from a lot of uh, paracrine and uh, other hormone also. So that's the main thing. The other question I have, uh, did you measure any placental EVs instead of uh, circulating EVs in pregnancy condition, especially this uh, stress? We haven't been able to, I know PLAP is a common marker um, for pregnancy EVs, but we've also been able to, at least the antibodies that we've tried, um, we've also been able to identify PLAP from non-pregnant uh, EVs. And so uh, we don't have any good tools right now um, working. We have some sort of uh, 
projects uh, in the works trying to develop, um, you know, uh, transgenic models so that you can specifically uh, see vesicles from specific cell types. Um, but yeah, we're not able to distinguish um, EVs that come from the placenta um, as opposed to any other tissues. It's kind of just uh, thought that the placenta produces a lot of EVs. Um, but as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, everything about mom is changing. And so it's likely that um, other tissues are also producing more, more vesicles as well. Yeah, that uh, uh, I have uh, one more the other questions. When you, I saw that you were a stress model, how you collect the uh, EVs for different gestation age, like 12.5 and 15.5 uh, and 18.5. Mm -hmm. So how do you get it? Do you get it from only the blood or the placenta? Or, or yeah, it's have a chance to uh, um, check the placental expand culture. Uh, you can also isolate EVs from the placental expand culture. That will give you the clear picture uh, where it's coming from EV, right? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great point. Um, for right now, we've just been looking at circulating EVs. Um, I mean, everything has its sort of issues, right? And um, so, yeah, you're right that growing placentas in an explant culture, you know, you would isolate just the vesicles from that, but then you're, okay, well, this placenta is no longer hooked up to mom and no longer hooked up to baby. And so a lot of different factors are changing. And so I think for um, the studies that we've done, uh, we're mostly just interested in, you know, what the what the in vivo um, condition is. And that would be great if we could identify specifically um, that these, these EVs are coming from, that these EVs are coming from the placenta. But um, like I said, we're just not there yet. So just kind of have to work with what we have in, in this context. Okay, that's great, thank you. Yeah, thanks. That was, that was very interesting. So Danila, um, you're next. Hello. Hi. Anna, very nice talk and interesting topic. Uh, my question was rather a technical first one. So with NTA measurements, these were sec fractions of uh, purified plasma, right? Yeah. So were you able to distinguish vesicles from lipoproteins in this case with some uh, fluorescent labeling or was it just a general particle concentration increase? Yeah, it's just a general particle. Um concentration. Um, so yeah, I think the columns that we use, um, I think are pretty good at uh, eliminating lipoproteins. But yeah, you're right that um, we're probably getting other things than just um, than just vesicles in our sample. And there was also this follow up questions. Um, basically, do you do you see that uh, or do you maybe expect that there is some uh, changes in lipoprotein status in if if you up or down regulate the OGT expression or you expose the the animals to to stress in, in general? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess the short answer is uh, that no, I don't know, um, but it's definitely something uh, to think about and. Um, as we're writing this up, you know, thinking about how, um, how, yeah, how lipoproteins may, may change as a result of uh, different uh, post translational modifications. And so, yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that Danilo really made a great point that you have to be careful about lipoproteins because actually, usually, I mean, usually they are in a higher concentrations in blood than EVs. So it might be that some of the effect you see is also connected to other particles. So perfect to, <laughs> to stress that. Yeah. Um, and we have um, Sharuk. Um, so which dye did you use for tracking EVs in circulation after injection? So how did you track this EVs? Yeah, so we um, we used a lipophilic dye. Um, the it's a, I forget exactly which one we used, but um, yeah, the lipophilic dye. So we incubate the EVs uh, with the dye and then um, wash them and then um, reinject. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. okay. So if yeah, if anybody has a follow up question, just please type. Or, uh -huh. He's asking if um, this is maybe PKH twenty six or another uh -huh, 
Anant is actually commenting. <laughs> but probably now there are so many different ones that people yeah. use, so it's going to be difficult to, to find. <laughs> yeah. we, we can start. We can start collecting all the different names, but yeah. Um, so, uh, and then Kylie uh, has a question about the lipids. So. Hi, Hannah. Um, <laughs> great talk, always, as always. Um, I was actually thinking a little bit because I've been working more and more with a uh, chemist, Aaron Baker, um, looking at like lipidomic profiles in various tissues. I'm wondering, have people uh, tried to use lipidomic analysis of EVs as like a way to track what tissues they're coming from? Because I'm wondering if we can start using that as a better way to determine um, what signal that like where that signal is coming from as a way to parse out the biomarker like is the placenta yeah. can we mark them as placenta evs based on the lipid membrane yeah yeah that's uh we've talked about that a few times um and just haven't actually made it happen um it, you know it's <laughs> always a money game right um yeah 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 but i uh, should introduce you to aaron baker and maybe you guys can chat a little bit she has a really um interesting technique uh using ion mobility mass spec okay. to look at lipids and do lipidomics so if you ever want to yeah. get in touch with her let me know <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um but yeah i think um lipid profiles is uh definitely a, a useful <laughs> Um, tool. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think we're all just a bit afraid of lipids all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Afraid to start working with it, but actually there's yeah. a lot of hidden knowledge there, so definitely yeah. a great way to start. Oh, uh, and uh, I have another, uh, just one more question. Um, <laughs> so you said the stress suppresses EV numbers. I mean that you have lower um, plasma EV numbers um, in the context of stress. Do you think this is the result of um, decreased release of EVs into the blood or increased uptake of EVs? Do you think that uh, just the dynamic changes or? Yeah, so I think that uh, it could go either way. We have actually done um, some cell culture work. So um, culturing placental cells and then treating with uh, stress hormone. Um, and in that, we also see a decrease of EVs. And so um, my, my first response would probably be that it's a decrease of release. Um, mm -hmm. But but yeah, in it, an in vivo system is so different, right, than a, than a plate um, of all of the same cell type. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it could go either way. I, my guess would be a decrease in release, um, but um, yeah, it's you're right. It's a very dynamic system. And, um, Did you ever um, measure monocytes in blood of these um, mothers? Because I think that there's this uh, there was these papers published that the if you have more monocytes, they would um, take up more EV, so that they they change the yeah the yeah. That's uh, we we haven't um, we haven't measured um any any sort of like cell profiles in the blood or anything like that um but yeah that would be interesting if um if the you know immune profile changes and you know so perfect so are there maybe any other questions from from anyone any Can last I ask question? one more yeah sure go ahead yeah so, uh, so Hannah, you, you spoke about annexin A1. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know whether can you do a conditional knockdown of annexin A1 in utero and look for a defect like what you're actually seeing in terms of stress? Yeah, we talked about that a few a, uh, a few months ago actually, um, and we couldn't find a commercially available mouse. Um, uh, but yeah, definitely, you know, kind of. Annexin plays a role in so many different things in metabolism and immunity. And, and so, um, yeah, this, it kind of finding that oblique inoculation of annexin was altered in, in these stressed animals in the placenta is what kind of led us into EVs. But um, we haven't done um, a lot of work looking specifically at uh, annexin and sort of its its role 
Um, we just kind of use it as a kind of to lead us into the EV realm. So does uh, does the OS, uh, OGT uh, knockout leads to any as a knock yeah, knockout leads to any biogenesis related genes upregulation downregulation or perturbation? Um, not that not that I know of. Um, the paper the first paper that was sort of describing OGT they did um, microarrays um, in the placenta, and so um, they were looking for specific. Um, genes and so yeah I, I don't think that we have since done like a seek um, experiment that would give us a, a bigger picture of if some sort of biogenesis was altered or something like that but Perfect. that's a good point as well thank you <laughs> yeah thank you. lots of lots of great points lots of good things to think about so I yeah, really appreciate I think yeah I think that you'll be busy right I mean you should start your group really <laughs> soon because there's a lot of things that you have to still do <laughs> Uh, so yeah so but thank you for taking your time and sharing your work um it was very interesting and thank you yeah. um yeah me. yeah so um i would just also like to thank all the attendees to that have joined today and please come back next week there'll be another topic another interesting uh, discussion and we'll see you in one week so bye bye everyone <laughs> thank you bye